Okay, let's start. Hi, everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about... Okay, may, uh, maybe I won't use it. Okay. Today, today we're going to talk about some uh, GitHub Action worms. So this talk is going to be very technical. Can you hear me good in the back? Yeah? Woo! Let's go. Uh, I try to not lose you. If you get lost, you'll have uh, something that will show you the pro progress bar uh, on the bottom of the slides. And this is basically a result of a research I did. It took about uh, three months. My basic goal was to find a new way to attack CICD pipelines. And this is what I came up with. This is a new way which will understand slowly the real impact and the uh, scale of it. So a bit about myself. My name is Asi Greenholz. I'm a security researcher currently at uh, Palo Alto Networks. I uh, have around eight years of experience in cybersecurity. I've done incident response, uh, SOC, security architecture, and of course, uh, application security. For the last two years, I've been working for Cyber Security, which was acquired not too long ago uh, by Palo Alto Networks, and I research uh, CACD uh, security and uh, all the things that revolve uh, around it. So. Uh, let's talk about some notable projects I've been a part of. So the first one is the top 10 CACD risks. This is a project we re released about a year ago, and it was embraced by OWASP. You can find it on uh, GitHub, also uh, on OWASP's uh, website. The second one is the CACD Go. This is a deliberately vulnerable uh, CACD environment, basically a CTF in which you can uh, hack a real CACD environment that's being installed on your local computer. Uh, you can find it on GitHub, download it, play with it, and learn how to hack, hack uh, CACD pipelines. Now, before we begin, let's do a quick overview of what GitHub Actions is. So how many of you are using GitHub Actions by a raise of hand? OK, that's a lot. Nice. So I'll do this quick, and we'll just uh, get everybody to the same page. So GitHub Actions is a continuous integration and continuous delivery platform CACD that allows you to automate your build, test, and deployment pipelines. You can see uh, on the left side, uh, there are events that can trigger pipelines, such as push, pull request events, and so on. And pipelines in GitHub Actions are called workflows. Workflows can contain multiple number of jobs, as you see. Each job uh, is running on a different runner, and on each job can contain multiple number of steps. Each step can contain a bash command or an action. What is an action? An action is basically a code package that uh, allows you to use someone else's, let's say, library to uh, execute some stuff in your pipeline. For example, you want to do something that probably everyone does, like checking out the code from the repository to the runner itself. You don't want to develop it yourself. Someone else probably already developed it. So you can use an action that checks out your code from the, the repository to the runner itself. Now let's uh, see an example of a workflow, a simple one. Uh, so uh, let's start with the first part. So we have the on keyword, which is the triggers of the workflow. Here it's triggered by uh, a workflow dispatch, which is a manual trigger, uh, push to the main branch, and pull request. Pretty easy. Next, we have the jobs. We have only one job here. It's called check links, and it's running on an Ubuntu uh, virtual machine. Next, we have the steps. So here we have the first step that, that checks out the code and it uses an action. The name of the action is actions slash checkout at v3. Now what the v3 means, it's the version of the action, and the actions slash checkout is the organization slash repository. So actions are contained in a GitHub uh, repository, and this is how you reference them and how you call them. This specific action was written by GitHub themselves. The actions organization is an organi organization that's maintained uh, by GitHub. Next, we have the uh, setup node step which uses a setup node uh, action, which also receives two inputs, as you can see uh, here. Actions can also uh, return outputs, which is nice, uh, simple stuff. And next we have uh, a bash command that's uh, using to uh, do npm ci, install all the dependencies of the package here. And after that, we see a third party package. This is a package that was written by someone on the internet and uh, published as a public repository, and we're using it here. Uh, you can see at the end, there's a different reference type. This reference uh, is a hash commit of the repository. We'll go uh, later exactly into what it means and how we can use it, but this is the, ba uh, the basic idea of workflows. And here you have a screenshot of the GitHub Actions, Git of the GitHub Marketplace, and specifically the actions. Uh, when I took this picture not too long ago, there was around 19,000 actions on the marketplace. 
The vast majority of them is actions written by the community. Some of them are written by GitHub, some of them are written by uh, vendors, but the majority is written by kind people on the internet. So let's talk about the worm itself now, finally. So in order to understand how to build the GitHub Actions worm, we need to understand a few parts of the puzzle which we'll build, we will build uh, during this uh, presentation. And the different parts are initial attack vector, action dependencies, action to infect actions, and finding attack graphs at scale. Now, if this doesn't mean anything to you right now, you'll understand it in a few minutes. Uh, but we'll go through each one of them, basically com completing the puzzle. And when the puzzle will be finished, we'll be able to show a demo of the worm itself attacking repositories. So let's start with initial attack vectors. So most of the uh, CICD attacks that happened up until now were done kind of in a si similar fashion. Basically, attackers compromised a repository or a package or so some kind of a project. And they infected it with code that is used to directly uh, infect the direct dependence of the package. Let's, uh, let's uh, show some examples. So one of them will be to exfiltrate environment variables when the package is being run, to steal maybe secrets from the pipeline execution or from production environments. Second thing may be to uh, run a reverse shell. When this package is being run in production, it will start a reverse shell, allowing attackers access to production environments. But when they compromise a package, they basically only affect the direct dependence. And let's see. Uh, few examples of how to uh, compromise GitHub repositories specifically with some known attack vectors. So we're going to talk about three attack vectors. I've implemented scanning and uh, automatically for those uh, attack to look for uh, vulnerable repositories that are vulnerable to those attack in attacks in my research. So this is the reason they're only relevant. They're the only ones relevant for this presentation, but there are, of course there are more. So let's go through them. The first one is repojecting. What is repojecking? On the left, we have a repository that's using the action in the middle. The action is part of an organization. And let's say one day the maintainer wakes up and decides to move the action to a new organization. Nice animations. So what happens next? The repository makes a request to the action, and GitHub automatically re redirects it to the new repository. That's great, right? But what happens when the maintainer decides to delete the old organization? Well, when it, when, when it doesn't exist anymore, an attacker can come and basically register the same organization name and same old repository name. When another request is being made by the repository, it will cancel the redirection, which will actually compromise the repository that is using the now malicious action instead of the original one which was moved or maybe deleted. Now, GitHub knows of this issue, and they've made a mitigation. They retired the namespaces of projects that had more than 100 clones in the week leading up to the account's uh, deletion or uh, renaming. But still, it's not foolproof. It's not still tight. There are still cases which uh, repositories are repojectable. We won't talk about why, but I'll show you some real examples of repositories that have repoject. Uh, but it's still possible. So just know uh, this for now, and you can look it up later. The next one is NPM email hijacking. So here we want to basically hijack an NPM package. How can we do it? So we pass the package log JSON over a repository, getting all the packages that the target repository that we want to compromise is using. For each package, we'll send a request to the NPM registry to get the manifest of the package. Inside the manifest, we find a few interesting things, the maintainers and their emails. For each email, we can uh, send a request to check if the uh, domain of the email is available for purchasing. Basically, the maintainer created an email for themselves, and they forgot to renew the domain, or the domain got expired or deleted or something like that. And if it's possible to buy the domain, we buy the domain. We can then set up a mail server, redirect the emails to our inbox, and reset the maintainer's password. Now, this is only possible on accounts that don't have two-factor authentication, but still, a lot of accounts that have two-factor authentication. And of course, I'll also show you a real example uh, later. Now, NPM also knows of this issue. And this is a snip snapshot for the, from, them, from their uh, documentation. And they're saying that, they're per they, uh, sorry, that they periodically check uh, if packages have expired domains, and if so, they disable the account from doing password resets. The issue is that uh, today there are on NPM around 2.5 million packages, probably huge numbers of different domains, and it's pretty hard to scan them daily or even weekly. I don't know how long they're doing it for, but let's say you're an attacker and you want to target specific packages, 
and you scan them like even hourly if you have like few packages and you check if the domain is if the domain is expired or something like that and you can buy them before npm makes their checks you can still take over the uh, package and uh, do this attack of course if they don't have uh, two factor authentication and the last one is command injection so here we have a code snippet from a github action you can see here simply simple configuration of the git client and then pushing some code to the repository now in the line uh, with the red box you can see that it's using something that's called context so as i told you github actions when github uh, workflows when they're triggered they receive they're triggered by an event the workflow itself receives the event in the type of a context and it can access some fields on the events and get data about what triggered the event itself so for example one of the events that are available is the author email of the head commit now who controls the author email of the head commit whoever did the commit and not the maintainers of the repository so they can write anything they want there one of the funny things they can write in the author email of the git commit is this string what is this nice uh, string this is basically command injection we write an email we do uh, like a small uh, backtick before and after the curl command we download a malicious bash script and execute it and, ex and execute it inside the pipeline so you simply do that on your computer push the code with this nice email and it will cause this uh, code snippet here to execute your code download the bash script and execute malicious stuff which is nice now of course there are more attacks as i've told you some of them are dependency confusion public ppe and just creating a malicious pull request hoping the maintainers will uh, merge it now you think maybe this is crazy but uh, actually someone did it to the linux project about a year or two ago they didn't like it so much but uh, they actually successfully committed malicious code with a vulnerability uh, to the linux project and of course there are more i won't get into what each of those attacks are you can look it up on google but just know there are more possible uh, ways now how can we further our attack we just understood how to compromise a single repository of course here we're going to talk about worms we want to compromise infinite repositories how can we do that so next thing we'll talk about is action dependencies now uh, there there are a few types of actions three types to be exact the first one is a docker action you can see here it's using a docker file you can also use a docker image to define what the action does now what you're seeing here is the action yaml file this is a file that sits at the root of the repository that defines what the action actually does so this is like the main uh, function of the action so this is simple next we have a javascript action you can write plain javascript and this is also relevant for the npm email hijacking attack because if an action uses javascript and it has a dependency that we can hijack we can hijack the uh, uh, action and the third one which is important for the dependency part is a composite actions now composite actions can use other actions as part of their uh, logic and they they can also execute bash so this is the first type of dependencies between action a, a composite action can actually depend on other action and just execute it when it's been uh, executed now what is the second way actions are depending on each other actions are stored on github they obviously need their own ccd and most of the times what ccd platforms do they use github actions of course so here's an example of a github workflow of an action you can see that it uses other action other other actions well this is a dependency not in a similar fashion that we know like code libraries this is kind of an implicit dependency now this action is depend the action that this workflow workflow belongs to is depending on the actions that are being run inside its workflow but it's not part of the code itself now as you saw in the snippet uh, that I've showed you of, uh, that I've showed you of the command injection maybe it has some permissions maybe we can uh, by compromising an action in the workflow push malicious code to the repository maybe we'll see it maybe not maybe nothing will work um, so this is the other way actions are dependent on each other using the cac using ac other actions in their uh, cacd now what we can do is basically take those two files parse them and build a huge tree on neo4j of action dependencies and this is exactly what i did and this is uh, how i do art i don't know how to paint so this is my art i create flowers of dependencies uh, using uh, github actions I promise you this is a random query of the database I didn't make it like by, my, by by myself. So what we're seeing here are action dependencies. We can see a repository uh, with a purple node. Now we pass the files and we can see all the action usages. 
each uh, orange node of an action usage is an action which comes from a repository. So we have a purple node that's connected to an action usage node, which is connected to the repository of the action being used, and so on. It goes recursively. And you can see this in this uh, beautiful flower that we have all the actions uh, like uh, on the outer side of the flower that are dependent on the one in the middle, which is nice. Uh, let's see the same graph in a different way. This is the same graph. Now, here we want to target the repository on the left. How can we do that? Let's say we have some weak link in the chain. Uh, some action is using another action, which uses another action. And the other action was created by someone, by some, someone random on the internet. They probably made it. They didn't uh, make so much effort to secure it, so on. So we can maybe compromise it. And by compromising that action, potentially, we may be able to climb up the tree, infect all the actions that are dependent on, dependent on it, and uh, reach our target. Now, how can we do the initial infection of the weakest link? This is by the, you can see the line that it's missing there. But we can do it using one of the initial attack vectors that we talked about earlier. So we have a few parts of the puzzle. We know that we have the initial attack vector, and now we need some kind of a way to infect actions and to jump from one action to another action. So let's see actually how, how to do it. So action to infect actions. We'll start with uh, talking about secrets in GitHub Actions. So here we have an example workflow that uh, I'll use to explain uh, how secrets work. So we have the first uh, job on the top that's using the first secret, as you can see, and the second job that uses the second secret on its second step only second step. Now, you can see some interesting bash code here uh, in the red box. What this bash code does is basically dump the memory of the runner and uh, grab for secrets in its memory. Now, secrets are stored in clear text in the memory of the runner. I know this thanks to uh, research by a guy that's mentioned here uh, below, Karim Rahal. And uh, how, wh what he described in his research is that uh, the job receives all the secrets that are being used inside the job even before it starts. So it doesn't matter where we dump the secrets inside the job, we'll get all the secrets that are available. So here we see an example that we're dumping the secrets even before it's being used. And let's see how the secret dump will look like. So this is the decoded base64 of the dump. We see the second secret and its value, I'm a secret. And we also see a GitHub token. We'll get in, in a second into what GitHub token is. But so far, we know that all secrets are accessible to all steps in a job. We didn't see the first secret because it, it's on a different job, which runs on a different runner. We only saw the second secret. Uh, another uh, point uh, worth mentioning is that on self-hosted runners, if they're not configured correctly and they're not destroyed after each execution of a workflow, we may be able to get secrets of past jobs that were ran on the same runner, which is much cooler. Um, and the GitHub token is accessible, although it wasn't even referenced in the workflow at all. So these are the two important things we know. And uh, what is the GitHub token? So in the start of each workflow, GitHub generates a token for the workflow. So the workflow can use it to authenticate to GitHub's API and perform actions like pushing code to the repository, uh, publishing comments on pull requests, querying some data about, data about the repository, basically identifying as the workflow itself. Now, uh, to understand the next part, we'll uh, get into how actions are being called. Uh, everything will just uh, get to, uh, will like complete the picture in, few, in a few seconds. So there are three main ways to reference actions. There are more ways, but those are the ones that are relevant for this presentation. We can reference an action using a hash commit. Uh, we can reference it using a branch or a tag. So the GitHub Actions uh, runner will know which action it needs to fetch. Now, if we want to infect actions, we need to modify one of those references. Now, modifying uh, an existing commit hash might be a, a bit difficult. But we can create a new commit to an existing branch. And we, w something else we can do is we can delete an existing tag, creating a new malicious commit, and creating uh, the same tag name with the new uh, malicious commit. Now, let's see how it's actually being done. Just a diagram. So here we have an action repository on the left, which uses uh, GitHub Actions as its CI CD. And it uses the compromised action on the right using the main branch reference. Now, we want to infect the main branch of the left uh, action. How can we do that? So when the job begins, of course, uh, as we said, the runner generates a GitHub token for the job. 
And also, because we can dump secrets, as, we sh as I showed earlier, we may be able to use some personal access tokens that are being used during the workflow. Maybe they also have some uh, nice permissions that we can uh, exploit. Uh, so when the compromised action is being run, it can use this uh, token to push code back to the main branch. Now, this is only possible if the main branch doesn't have branch protection rules. But what can we do if it does have uh, branch protection rules? We can do the same thing. Let's, hear, let's see here like a different scenario. We want to uh, infect the temporary branch. So th same thing, the token is being generated. We push code to the unprotected branch because the main one has branch protection rules. And then we push a new tag to the repository. And by that, uh, overriding an existing tag, uh, which will now cause any uh, new uh, request for using the action to use the new malicious tag. We'll see an actual example of this. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, and to do that, of course, all those pushes and stuff like and uh, stuff like that, and uh, deleting tags, we need permissions. So, how does Git the GitHub hack the GitHub token permissions work? So, up until up until uh, not too long ago, uh, all the repositories had default write permissions for the tokens. Uh, GitHub changed it uh, about half a year ago, but this still means that most of the repositories on uh, GitHub nowadays have write permission to the token by default, which is great for hackers, not so great for the maintainers of the repositories. And what maintainers can do, if they still need the write permissions, they can uh, override the permissions of the token specifically for specific workflows, like this uh, snippet here, which says that the content permission which is used for pushing code to the repository uh, will be set to read, even though the repository is defined to have write uh, access for the token. Now, in my research, I wanted to find which repositories are actually uh, vulnerable to this kind of attack and which repositories will allow the worm to spread between them. So I needed to calculate what is the actual permissions of the GitHub token. Now, if I see this, I know the uh, exact permissions. But if it doesn't exist, I need to find out the default permissions of the repository. How can I uh, see that? We can look at the logs. It says there, right in uh, clear text, the GitHub token permissions are right. And we can just pass the logs. Uh, it sounds simple, but to actually implement it and uh, like get all the logs from the repositories and get the ones that are relevant is a bit more complicated than I, than I expected at first, but it worked eventually. So let's do a quick recap of what we've got until now. So the first step to uh, execute the worm is to compromise a repository using one of the three initial attack vectors I've uh, showed earlier. The next step is to infect actions by using uh, the uh, GitHub token or a personal access token inside the repository to push code to the main branch, one or another branch that is being used, or override an existing tag. By that, we'll climb up the tree, the tree of action dependencies, and we'll reach the uh, target repository in which we'll be able to execute code, steal secrets, maybe modify its code, and a lot of fun uh, like this. Now. Let's start with the automation. How can we find vulnerable repositories like this one at scale? So what I did was this process. So the first thing I did was to collect targets. I collected two types of targets. The first one is the top 10, uh, top 10K uh, repositories in GitHub by stars. And the second one was uh, 32K repositories of companies with bug bounty programs. I collected this data using a database that's here in the picture. It contains a lot of bug bounty programs. And what I did next is to filter out all the repositories that are not using GitHub Actions, because it's not relevant. Then I cloned each repository to my computer, checked for the three initial attack vectors. If I found one that's possible, I added a red node inside the new 4J graph. And then I collected the metadata about the actions. So I collected, uh, I passed the action YAML files and the workflow YAML files that we've seen earlier to find which uh, actions this repository is depending on. And I collected this metadata about each action. You can see if the content right permissions is true or false according to the calculation of the different permissions and the override of the permissions inside the workflow file. Um, we can see here the name of the action, which line it was used in, what secrets are accessible to it inside of the job. Here it's empty, but of course there are a lot of secrets that are accessible to a lot of actions. And Next thing, we do, next thing I did was to go through this step for each action. So for each action dependency I find, I clone its repository, search for its dependencies, check for uh, initial attack vectors, and for each dependency, this process goes on and on and on. And by using this uh, process, we can create this beautiful graph. Now, this is a real case of a project that's vulnerable 
uh, to this attack. Now let's explain, let's, let's explain what we're seeing here. So at the bottom we see two red arrows that are pointing to two initial attack vectors. Now those two uh, repositories that it points to are actually the same repository which was moved from one name to another. So it has two references but it's actually the same repository. Now what this repository is, is is a dependency of some other actions that are using it. And those other actions are a dependency of the target repositories that have, that have started scanning. So in this picture, we can see that by attacking one repository and compromising it, we can compromise uh, 18 uh, intermediate actions. And by compromising them, we can compromise 72 of the target repositories I initially started scanning, which is super crazy. But still, this is not the whole picture of, uh, and the impact and scale of this attack. Sadly, I cannot disclose the exact names of uh, those repositories. I can tell you that the target repositories that you see here are target repositories of huge companies, names that all of you know. And uh, I'll show you some real example to, uh, which I can disclose to uh, describe the real impact and scale uh, of this attack. So here's a real example that I can show all the participants in this uh, attack graph. So what we're seeing here on the bottom left side, we can see the Hangfire repository, which is a popular open source, about 8K, 8, 8K stars on GitHub. And it uses two actions, which you can see in the uh, orange nodes. Those two actions come from uh, two repositories, the Veracode repository at the top and the Payploto repository at the bottom. Now, the Payploto repository has a red node connected to it, which says repojecting, meaning this repository is repojectable. Now, next thing I did was to register the organization. I am the owner of the Payploto organization, as you, as, and, and as you can see here in my screenshot, I can register the action zip repository. Now, I didn't do that in order to not break anyone, anyone's pipeline or execute malicious code on like, innocent people, but it's possible I still own this organization. Uh, and I, of course, reported this issue to the uh, other uh, repositories that are depending on it, and they fixed it. But let's see how their workflows looked like. So this is the Veracode uh, repository, the Veracode workflow. You can see it's using the Payploto, the action that I'm able to uh, repoject. And you can see here the Hangfire repository, which uses the Payploto and the Veracode repository. So, and also in the middle, you can see some secrets that it uses that, of course, this uh, worm can potentially access. So this means that in order to attack these Hangfire repositories, we have two paths. We can directly attack it using the ActionZip repojectable repository. We can also repoject the ActionZip repository, infect the Veracode repository, and through that, infect the Hangfire repository. Now, this looks... Simple, right? This is the same diagram. We see the same repositories. So, okay, we reproject this one repository. We get to two other repositories. Sound boring, right? But you can see because there's a lot of uh, empty space on the slide that there's actually much more to that. So, uh, the, let's say we do this attack. We reproject the action zip repository and we by that infect the Veracode and the target repository. But this is not the whole story. The Veracode repository is an action by itself, which has 1.6K dependence, which we can also infect them. And these dependents probably have more dependents and more dependents and so on. So that's it. And uh, the action zip repository also have about 600 dependents, which probably have maybe their own dependents. So we can see uh, th this looks like, OK, that's a lot of, of repositories. Instead of attacking like three, I can now attack like 2,000 repositories. Yeah, it's nice, but still there's a lot of empty space on the slide. Uh, the Hangfire repository actually creates a NuGet package, which has 9.4K daily downloads, which is nice. So we can also compromise all the 9.4K daily downloads of the NuGet package. But this is still not the full picture. Now, this is only public information. Those are only public repositories that we've seen. What about all the private repositories? There are probably a lot more private repositories that are dependent on this action. And by infecting them, we can also uh, propagate inside private organizations. Now, let's say even if we don't have right permissions for the GitHub token, actually running the worm inside those private repositories, uh, they give us read permission, which we can use to exfiltrate source code of a lot of companies, uh, potentially, or organizations. So you can say now, OK, so this is really cool, real crazy. Huge impact of the attack, right? But that's not it. That's just one uh, scenario, one attack path. I found a lot of those. And this is actually the real impact of the attack. Woo! Woo! Nice, yeah. Let's see some energies. 
Now we finally have all the different puzzle pieces combined, and the next thing we can do is some PowerPoint magic. And let me introduce you the Dendro Worm. The word Dendro comes out of the world, the word Dendrology, which is the science and study of woody plants. This is how I called my uh, pet worm. And uh, let's see uh, how the demo actually looks like. So in the demo, we'll see this environment. In this environment, we have the target repository on the left, which uses uh, a GitHub Actions uh, CACD workflow that uses the random action uh, action using a V1 tag git tag uh, annotation. The random action also uses GitHub Actions, and it uses the main branch annotation of the rev date action in its workflow. The rev date action is a composite action which uses directly the uh, rev action. Now, as an attacker, what we'll do is we'll start with uh, write access to the repository on the right, we'll infect it with malicious code of the worm, and then uh, it will automatically, of course, infect the uh, composite action because it uses it as part of its uh, logic. And then we'll see what happens when a maintainer of the random action uh, runs, uh, creates a pull, uh, push to the main branch of its repository, which will trigger the workflow. When the workflow is being triggered by running the compromise action, the uh, worm will infect the repository by overriding an existing tag, which this tag is being used by the target repository. So when the target repository, the repository workflow is being ran, it will actually uh, execute the model itself, and then we'll be able to steal uh, secrets. Now, let's see the demo itself. Um, let's do duplicate. Okay, nice. Okay, you can see here in the bottom, there's the same graph that I've shown you. It's uh, dynamic, so it will evolve uh, during the uh, the demo. On the right side, you can see the terminal of the server, and on the left side, the repositories. Now, we'll start with the first uh, repository. Here it's in, here it's, it's uh, uh, action YAML file, and we're infecting it with malicious code, some zoom magic, Opa. and uh, we see that we're downloading a malware from the server and uh, installing it as a Python package and executing it. Now, I did it using Python just as a POC, but this, is, of course, can be done much more stealthy. And now we commit the changes to the repository, and we go to the second repository. Now, the second repository, we can see it uses the first repository as part of its uh, composite action YAML file, which means this repository is automatically compromised because next time it will run, it will run the malicious uh, action we've just uh, infected. Next thing we see is the third uh, action. Here you can see it just ra uh, generates a random number, which does nothing and it has a CI-CD workflow. Now, this workflow uses the second action as part of its uh, logic. You can see here, so it using the, it's using the main branch, which uh, is infected because of the uh, uh, composite uh, action. And another thing we can see, this repository has a V1 tag that was created yesterday, which will overwrite soon. Now, here we can see the maintainer pushes new code to the main branch, which you'll see here it's uh, protected using branch protection, branch protection rules. This is why the override is needed. And this push triggers the workflow we've just seen. And you'll be, you'll be able to see in a few seconds on the right the worm being executed. Here you can see it's being downloaded, executed on the left. And in a few seconds we'll see the actual infection. And you can see that it didn't uh, uh, successfully infect it using a push but it successfully infected it using overwrite of the tag itself, and also it printed out all the secrets that are available, which is only the GitHub Action token. And we can see now the tag that's over, that, be, that was overwritten just now. Here is the new malicious code, same code that, uh, like the infection we did at the start. And now we see in the target repository, which also has its CI, which uses the action that just got, just got infected using the V1 tag that uh, uh, was just uh, added, uh, was just got uh, also infected. And it's also using the very secret secret, very cool name. And uh, what we see here next is the maintainer of the repository pushing code to the main branch, like everything as usual, business as usual. And it will trigger the uh, workflow that we've just seen. And same thing happens, we'll see the malware being downloaded and executed and installed. And you can see here that it 
successfully exfiltrated the secrets from inside. You can see it failed to infect the action, the workflow, beca the repository, beca because it's not an actual repository, but it did actually infect the secret. Uh, still a secret. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so we've just seen the demo of the actual malware, and we have a bit of time, so I'll show you more interesting stuff I found out during this research. So turns out there are a lot of repositories that are directly vulnerable to the three initial attack vectors. I've shown you at the beginning. I found 175 repositories directly uh, uh, vulnerable to those three attacks using 192 different ways. So some of the repositories had multiple command injection, injections available on them, multiple NPM email, hij uh, email hijacking of packages they're using. And those projects are actually projects of really uh, known uh, organizations. You can see the coolest one is I found a command injection in Angular, which is crazy. Probably everyone here is using Angular in some sort of a way, maybe as a, as a user, maybe as a developer. Uh, also, uh, I found some uh, command injection in a popular open source you can see here, the Astro open source, Canva. And in the uh, last uh, bullet, you can see I hijacked one email domain of a company that's called Plotly, and of course I reported it to them, but by, hijack by, by uh, possibly hijacking that one domain, I could uh, compromise 67 repositories that were maintained by this one user uh, that belonged to this company. Now this user actually had like 90 repositories, but only 60 of them belonged to the company. So technically I was able to uh, compromise 90 repositories by actually buying a single domain of a single user that forgot uh, to renew its uh, email domain. And now that we're uh, nearing the end, let's talk about how, act how, sorry, how actually you can protect yourself for, uh, from this attack. So the first and most important thing you can do, it's ordered by uh, most effective stuff to the less effective stuff. So you can uh, set the GitHub token and, and any personal access token being used inside the workflow uh, to uh, minimal permissions. Uh, basically the content permission is the permission that's used to push code. So, so if you don't need to push code to the repository, set it to read. You can also configure branch protection rules to prevent pushes to uh, uh, used branches and use protected tags, which is a less uh, known feature of GitHub. Uh, also, you can limit uh, outbound connections from runners to prevent downloading of uh, malware, like, this, like in this example. Now, of course, the worm itself can contain its own code inside its own code without like, uh, accessing the internet and still infect stuff, but it makes lives of uh, attackers uh, much harder. You can also pin actions by using a hash, which also makes it uh, a bit difficult uh, for attackers to perform this uh, attack. It's still not uh, sealed tight. And you can also use uh, this uh, project that was released by GitHub uh, not too long ago, which helps you to reduce permissions uh, for your workflows. Uh, that was the GitHub Actions Worm. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I think if we have some time for questions. Uh, do you have a mic or? Okay, yes. Yes. So, okay, so we asked how can I pass branch protection rules uh, to override a tag? So branch protection rules don't affect tags. So even if you have branch, you need to, you need to use the protected tags. It's a, it's a different feature. Uh, more questions? Yes. Can you say again a bit louder? I can barely hear you. Ah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so the companies I've showed uh, that I've reported this issue to, they fixed their workflows, they removed the uh, vulnerable uh, actions. Um, which makes them, uh, uh, which like uh, basically uh, mitigates this issue. Um, some, com uh, like most of the companies that had more like complicated uh, graphs, like you had to compromise a dependency of a dependency, of the, they didn't consider it as, a, as an issue because it's dependencies and like in bug bounties or generally in uh, vulnerability disclosure programs, they don't they consider it out of scope or not relevant. But um, yeah, it's still possible to attack them this way. Uh, more questions? 
Yes. Okay, so if I come around any malicious action being used in the wild, I actually didn't see anything. I didn't look for them, so that's maybe the reason. But there are malicious actions like probably around there. Not doing this stuff probably, but maybe other stuff, yeah. More questions? More questions? Okay, thank you.